Hello. Hola. Thank you for coming. I'm sorry I don't speak. Um, I'm sorry I only speak English, but um, bear with me. Um, thanks, uh, Ivan, and everyone who uh, came left for inviting me to come talk to you and for all the great AV help I just got so I can show my slides and see my cheat sheet down here at the same time. Um, hi, I'm Tim, and I'm going to talk uh, about games and art and uh, ideas and stuff for a while. Let's see if that works. Yes. First slide works. Can you hear me okay? Let me get right on the mic. Like, so it sounds really loud. Now can, how about, how about that? Is that even better? Um, great. So art. <laughs> there was this thing a while back people used to talk about all the time and get interviewed a lot about it. Are games art or are they not art? And it was really, um, some people thought a really boring conversation because to us who make games, we always thought of them as art and there really was no controversy to it. There was just this controversy among people who either didn't play games or, you know, for some reason didn't want to consider them art. Um, I assume every, I would think people, most people coming here and in this room would be here because they, they think of games as art. Um, uh, so I won't linger on that debate too long. But I still think in the games industry and among people who make games, there's still some, you know, resistance to talking about them as art, especially when it comes to the awkward point of calling yourself an artist because it just, it seems to have this, um, like, stigma attached to it, that there's something maybe too uh, self-centered about being an artist, something too um, pretentious about it. Um, or there's a thing in games where it's seen as much more of a service. So to be art, to be an artist is seen as kind of indulgent compared to um, uh, being a, uh, someone who produces a product, like a video game. So if you look at these two different kinds of artists, that we, we, we think of like, this is Jackson Pollock, for example dropping drips of paint on the glass. And this is a, a chef, and um, a famous New York chef. And um, we, we often talk about chefs also as being artists, like, oh, they're such great artists with their work. They're just amazing. Um, but if they serve you food that you didn't like, you would send it back and get mad. You wouldn't see, oh, this meal tastes terrible. This must be the chef expressing himself in the futility of mankind and <laughs> the, the, how terrible life is. And you, I, I can't wait to eat all this terrible food. You would never do that. And I feel like a lot of game customers especially feel that way. They're like, yeah, sure, express yourself, do something creative. But I mean, if you nerf the power on my shotgun, I'm going to send you death threats, you know. So <laughs> it's seen as art and it's also not seen as art. But um, I think it's very important to see it as art and to um, think of yourselves as artists. And because I think that comes from what I think art is, what art is all about for me. And I think it's, it's different for a lot of people. Um, everyone has their own uh, definitions. But to me, it's not about just, yeah, it's about personal expression, but it's not just look at me, look what I can make. It's about connections between people. And that's what's so important about it. And um, I often think about this uh, creation myth that I learned about when I was in college and studying folklore. And I wish I could remember the people whose creation myth this is, but I don't because college was a long time ago for me. Um, but if this is your personal creation myth, please let me know. And I apologize for stealing it from my slides. Um, uh, and this, uh, in this culture, the, the myth of how the world is created was that at one time we were all just one giant oversoul floating in space. We, all our souls were connected. We were just part of this one big like, diamond that was floating in space. And um, we were all together. And then one day, uh, God or gravity or something took the diamond and like sh cast it down to the ground, shattered it in a million pieces. The diamond was um, shattered and cast into the ground where it, it just got covered up in like mud and dirt and mud formed around all the diamonds. And then eventually these mud covered diamonds formed into um, hum humanity. They became people. Here they are, mud people. <laughs> and... Um, it, it, it's not that I personally believe in that that's how things happen, but I, it's something that feels kind of true in a way when you think about how we interact with each other and how we think about ourselves. It's like we go through our daily lives, we're like we have this mask, this persona of who we are, how we present ourselves to the world, and it's like this mud suit that we wear, and we're always going around saying things to each other that, oh, thanks for backing, by the way. Yeah, I saw a t-shirt, sorry. Um, it's an automatic response when I see one of those t-shirts. Um, 
Where was I? Yeah, okay. So a lot of the things that we're doing is going around telling people basically, look, oh, I swear I have this diamond inside of me. Does anyone else have one? Do you have one? That's, that's, that's how I sum up the human condition in a way. You know, there's this belief that you're like, I, you know, I, I think I exist and I think other people exist. Maybe they're just a dream I'm having. I don't know, but I wish I knew. I wish I felt this, we we're all this thing. And so we tell each other verbally, you know, we get to know each other, we talk about our paths, we get to know people, and we feel like, I think I see the inside, the shard of the diamond in you. Um, but what I think art is, art is like just cracking open that shell and just actually non-verbally just seeing that other similar piece of diamond in someone else, that, that, that connection that you get. I feel like that, that is what art is, is to me, is the cracking through all the different layers of personality and getting through this, that real basic human connection which I think is really important for having empathy with other people, which is what makes the world work. So that's why I think art is very important. Um, and so how do you, let me go back one. Oh, look, that worked. How do you, um, as long as you are sharing something that is really personal and really true about yourself, then I think you can make that connection with other people through art. And the question is, how do you do that? How do you reach deep inside of yourself and pull out something that is really true and really personal and do it over and over again for a living when your when your rent is dependent on it, and um, and and resist all the pressures of the practical world, which are based on you know a lot of pressure to make a lot of money and, and to please a publisher or do whatever you have to do. So um, to uh, to get into that, I um, it's important to note that creativity and having a creative job is not just one job; it's many jobs uh, put together. And this goes back to a talk I saw one of the very first. Um, GDC's, the Game Developers Conference in San Jose, California. I saw this talk by Roger Van Eck, uh, and he was giving a talk about creativity, and he wasn't in the games industry, and I'm always really suspicious of people giving seminars on creativity. But this one has stuck with me for years because he talked about the different roles of the artist, that you have to be, these are little icons representing his roles, the, uh, uh, an explorer who goes out and finds ideas, the artist who finds interesting ways of putting them together, the, the judge who critiques and edits, and then the warrior who fights for these ideas. Um, and he has a whole talk about it in a book, um, A Kick in the Seat of the Pants, I think his book is called. But um, I've been thinking about these things for years, and they were in the inspiration for in um, Psychonauts. There are these characters called the black, the dog, the art dogs in Black Velvetopia. There's a, a less, there's a um, a level of Psychonauts inside the mind of a black velvet painter, and there are these dogs, and they're selling art. And to me, they always uh, were loosely based on these four roles of the artist. There's the uh, Saint Bernard on the end, the first dog you meet in Black Velvetopia, who is a uh, explorer. He has like a a keg of booze around his neck, and he talks about how he wishes he was out in the Alps exploring, and he wants to he wants to go and see new places all the time. Then there's this collie who's like an artist who talks about talks when you have his dialogue is very artistically focused. And then there's this Dalmatian in the game who's just a, kind of a jerk when you talk to him. He's very critical, and he's like the judge. And then there's this bulldog who, who constantly is fighting the bull. This El Odio is running through town, and this bulldog will just fight him over and over and over again, and he never gives up fighting. Um, and that's just kind of stuck with me because I think it's important when you have like a creative uh, job to be able to switch between these roles all the time because there's times when you need to be just exploring ideas, just filling up your brain with experiences like the explorer does, just just going out and e even seeing movies, going to parties, climbing a mountain, you know, scuba diving, whatever it is, like these experiences that you gather in your mind that just fill up your brain with ideas. And then you have to switch over into the artist mode who comes up with interesting connections between these ideas and ways of like putting them together. Like, what if we mixed like Art Deco and film noir and Mexican folklore to make Grim Fandango? Like that was kind of like just to put these crazy ideas that we've experienced together and create something new. And then you have to completely switch modes and go into this judge mode where you look at yourself and look at your work and like, that's just no good and be willing to throw it out or cut it out. And, um, in games that involves a lot of playtesting, actually fo like watching people play your games and being able to like not have your feelings hurt when they can't solve your puzzles, but to actually learn from it. And then the last one, the bulldog or the warrior, is just is such, it's one of the most forgotten parts because people think, you know, I'm an artist, I shouldn't have to deal with this crap. You know, I'm just, you know, I just make things, I shouldn't have to go pitch publishers or deal with money and all this stuff, but all that stuff is so important if you actually want to protect your ideas and get them all the way over the finish line into the real world. So uh, I'm going to talk mostly today about the explorer type, just because that's the part that makes people think you're weird. Um, he's the one who um, 
Let me check time. Tell me if I go over. Um, the Explorer is the one who... Uh, oh, we started really late. Wow. Sorry about that. The Explorer is the one who makes people go like, Where did, what were you um, smoking when you came up with that game design idea? Like, what, like, what were you on? That's, um, and uh, it's not necessarily true, although people do get ideas from altering their state of consciousness by w whatever method they use. I'll get into some of mine later. Um, but I think it's about, it is about going on different experiences, doing things that make you feel uncomfortable, traveling to a, a country that doesn't speak your language, or, or um, just doing things to, to gather experiences. But also, it's about going on an inward journey into yourself and really um, plumbing those depths. And so that's what I'm going to talk about uh, Carl Jung, who's a psychologist from uh, Switzerland. And um, another thing I studied in, in college was psychology and the psychology of dreams. And Carl Jung was um, very influential as a creator of analytical psychology and um, the creator of terms like um, archetype and uh, collective unconscious and the shadow and all these things that, that people reference a lot these days. And um, I think a lot of it applies to uh, the process of becoming an artist and being a creative person. Uh, and he would, he would talk about the, the journey of individual Individuation. Individuation is Carl Jung's term for the act of, over the course of your life, becoming a, um, the fullest version of yourself that you can be. And uh, it, it's a lifelong process, and it's a process that goes into all these levels of understanding of your own unconscious. And I think that stuff is really interesting, so I'm going to talk about it. Here's a diagram of it. Here's you, according to Carl Jung, yourself, your whole, pers your whole self is here. And... Um, you can see the outer level is your consciousness. That's the part of yourself that you're aware of and you're thinking and you might think, oh, I had an idea because I, I put these two things together and that's the part you're aware of, you're conscious of. Then the next inner level is um, your unconscious, the things that come to you. You don't really understand necessarily where they came from, but they're definitely part of your unique personal experience. You know, Maybe something that happened to you as a child created this um, element of your unconscious mind that is, affects who you are as a person and what kind of creative ideas you have as an artist. And then. The inner layer is what he called the collective unconscious. And the collective unconscious is, I mean, he, what he was, what Jung believed was because our brains are all I, on a certain level, genetic level, mostly identical, you know, we came from the same ancestors, therefore there's a physiological part of our brains that are all the same, and that would have a psychological effect too. There'd be certain parts of our psychology that are, have the same roots. Not necessarily, we don't all think the same, but there are these roots to certain really important parts of our psyche that come from this, what he called the collective unconscious, the shared psychology among all people. And uh, the, the, the A's and the C's, the, uh, the A's are his, um, one of his big things, which are archetypes. And these are these essential elements of the, your collective unconscious that everybody has, these ideas that bubble up into your, un your personal unconscious and into your consciousness as you individuate, as you, as you progress as a person. And they, they are things like uh, really important things, like the idea of motherhood or fatherhood or um, you know, growing up and, and um, the devil and like all these different things that he feels like everyone has in their brain. But by the time they process themselves out of your unconscious into your conscious mind, um, they become your own. You make your own version of your our typical, you know, shadow or so it's an individual element. That's where a lot of uh, creative ideas come from. They come from these, these things that kind of bubble up into your consciousness and they're very, they're very unique to you. But if you can really tap into them, they might, someone else might see in them, they might recognize, oh, that, that is actually, that feels true to me too, because deep in my mind, I have these same archetypes that led to that same creative thing that you created. And that's why um, people will talk about using Jungian archetypes in your creative work, especially in screenplays. They talk about it a lot, because if you can tap into these things in the collective unconscious, the idea is that lots of people will relate to the work that you're doing, and it will feel really resonant and really deep. And the collective unconscious is also really a cool way to get around in Psychonauts connects all the brains together. This is a front level in Psychonauts that connects all the brain, all the mental worlds that you go to in the game are connected through this collective unconscious. And that's Raz. So, um, you, you see, this is just some examples of different archetypes that people talk about a lot, the hero, the jester, um, the, the wise old man, you know, and these, I, I hesitate even showing a list of them because, um, 
there's, there's, there, there really isn't a finite list of archetypes, but they're, and they're different for every person. And once you start actually naming them and describing them, they, they aren't archetypes anymore because they've left the unconscious mind. They become these things that we talk about that can become stereotypes. Like, oh, like every story always has this character. And, um, and that runs the risk of getting into, uh, I think, using them incorrectly, which is the, it works, it works in Star Wars disease. Like people, uh, there's, there's a book uh, by Joseph Campbell, Hero with a Thousand Faces, and it was very influential on, on George Lucas, and he talks about that, how this um, Joseph Campbell book, which was inspired a lot by the Carl Jung stuff I was talking about, um, led him to uh, inspire the script for Star Wars, and because Star Wars was so successful, a lot of people, when they teach screenwriting courses, just say, oh, you should do this, you should follow this formula that George did. You should put an Obi-Wan type character in your screenplay. You should add all these elements that, that Star Wars had, but that's not really what it's all about. It's not about just grabbing these kind of surface level things of the, of the hero's journey, which is often spoke of in, in Joseph Campbell books. This is the hero's journey where um, I think it just runs the risk of everyone, the, the thought is that in, the, in, the, the, in his study of all these different myths, he saw these patterns, Joseph Campbell, and so they could be part of every story. And I think it, you know, it, it, can become, it can become kind of formulaic, like you can just feel like uh, every story's got to follow these same patterns, when really it should be a much more individual process, much more back to this chart about when these common archetypes bubble up into your mind, they become something unique to you. And they're not a formula. They're not just reaching into somebody else's bag of tricks and pulling them into your story. They're like these things that you came up with. And um, so I'm going to talk about how do you do that? How do you, how do you reach into that weird collective uh, caveman mind and, and pull out creative ideas for your game that you're working on? Um, and something that Carl Jung talked about a lot was the importance of keeping a dream diary. Here's my dream diary I keep by my bed. It has a pit picture of... Um, from The Hobbit on it for some reason, but, um, and this is something that I started in college, but is really a, a really fun thing to do, and it really, um, really kind of teaches you a lot about yourself, and it starts off, this is often like your first, your first note you'll have in your dream diary, no dreams last night, because everyone thinks like, oh, I don't know, I don't have any dreams. I, I, I know, like, if I asked you all to remember the dream you had last night, most people would be, I don't, I, don't, I don't think I had any dreams last night. But when you leave this dream diary right next to your bed and you write every morning in it, pretty soon after like the third or fourth day, you have like these huge, tons of dreams. You have the, your whole notebook is full all the time of dreams, dreams, dreams. And it's like, <laughs> the more, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You like that dream? So I was um uh, I didn't think you guys would be able to read my handwriting. Okay. So um but as you start to write down your dreams, you'll find out, wow, I have a big dream every night and I never even noticed it cuz they you forget them so early in the morning. As soon as you wake up, you start to forget these dreams. And if you start writing them down, you'll realize you're having more and you'll start noticing you have tons of dreams every night. Um and the craziest things come out of dreams. And Carl Jung really believed that to understand yourself, you need to reflect on these dreams and think about what this means to you. And, um, and also, if you see something really visually striking, you should paint it. You should paint things you see in your dreams. And if you hear music in your dreams, you should try and write it down or hum it out and record it. And this is the process of like pulling these, pulling these deep things out of your, 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 your um, collective unconscious into your consciousness and, um, and learning a lot about yourself or getting ideas for video games, which I think is what Carl Jung would say if he was here today. Um, another way I do it is free writing, which is, um, this is, uh, I told someone I promised I'd have a picture of my notebook in here, because uh, I try to, like when I'm really being good about it, um, but even after all these years, it's still hard to keep this discipline. I try to, I try to write, you gotta try, don't try and read that whole thing, it's really long. Um, if I'm really good, I'll get into work and I'll lock my door and for at least an hour I'll try to just write in a notebook. Sometimes even just five minutes is really helpful, but the idea is not to sit there and think about what you're going to write, but to write constantly and your hand has to keep moving on the page. That's the main rule. Um, even if you're just writing the same word over and over again, like I don't know what to write, I don't know what to write, you just have to do that and that's the rule. But eventually you start to write stuff, you'll find. And the weird thing is you'll start to have ideas as you're writing because it... it it plays a trick on your on your brain. It takes you out of the judge mode of your four artist, you know, 
parts of your artist roles, it turns off the judge completely because you have to keep writing. There's no chance to edit anything. So you just have to write, 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 write. And it um, puts you in this kind of verbal state where I feel like even when I'm totally stuck and, and I have intense writer's block and I don't know what to do, if I just start writing, even though the writing is bad, it starts this big, huge wheel turning my brain that just starts to move. And then pretty soon I have enough momentum to actually get my job done. And, um, and it's important. It's an important thing. And I've, I've gone into work and felt like, oh, I stayed up too late last night. I'm really sleepy. I'm not going to get any work done. And I started free writing and I designed like entire games. Just when, not, every, not every morning for sure, but like every once in a while. That just happens, and so it's this real, I feel like, almost magical thing. It's just a weird trick. And it's like, it's like an altered state of consciousness, and that's what I was getting at before. Some people do, they do talk about, like, oh, before I design a game, I go out and take peyote in the, in the desert. Or, um, and that's another way to do it, I suppose. Uh, this is cheaper and less embarrassing. Um, but, but there's other ways people, so for some people, it's going for a jog. For some people, it's... Um, every, playing music, like everyone has this different way of kind of going into an altered state of consciousness. Some people just taking a shower, you know, walking around the block. You enter this different mode where all of a sudden you're solving problems and you didn't, um, didn't realize, you, you didn't think you had the answers in your head, but you did. Um, huh. um, and this gets into what, uh, the difference between where, where ideas come from and where we think they come from. Because a lot of times we just think, we think we know why we make these choices. Like art to me is about your, and the reason that you have to say games are art is because the people making them are constantly making these choices and they're expressing themselves by making choices when they're deciding what goes in a game and what's not in a game, whether it's a shooter or whether it's a story-based game or anything. So, um, and you know, if you ask the people, you know, what, what did this game mean or why did you make this choice? They'll tell you like, well, I would think this was, a, uh, I was making a commentary about nuclear war or something like that. And that's why they think they made those choices. But I feel that you, um, you can't really trust the artist to tell you what a piece of art means. You know, you're supposed to trust the art, not the artist, you know, and that's what it meant to them. And that was their intention, but they don't entirely know why they, um, why they make these choices that they do. And uh, a really simple example of that is, um, it's really dumb, but I was telling this friend of mine about uh, when I was in the like fourth grade, there was this bully who used to pick on me and my friend, and he called my friend elevator ears, and he'd pull on his ears, and he knocked over. We were out collecting polywogs one day, and he kicked over my bucket of polywogs. So sad. And, um, and he, I always remember, because he had this funny name, his name was Bob Berger. And, and, and the guy's like, his name is Bobby? And I was like, yeah, why? And he's Bobby, like Bobby Zilch in Psychonauts? And I was like, what? And he goes, yeah, the bully in Psychonauts is named Bobby. And I was like, huh? What? What? I didn't, huh? <laughs> like, <laughs> I had completely, without any intention on my own part, named the bully in Psychonauts after this guy who had picked on me in the fourth grade without even thinking about it. And um, I, that, I'm sure that doesn't sound that weird, but that that's just, to me, makes me, uh, makes you realize that, like, you say you know why you make these decisions, but you don't really know all the time why you made these decisions. Maybe you, you made an enemy in your game red and yellow striped because you, uh, you just think those are aggressive looking colors, but really maybe it was because a dog with a red and yellow striped collar bit you as a kid, or maybe in our collective unconscious, we are all these animals who were eaten by a giant red and yellow spider at one point. We don't know. You don't entirely know where ideas come from. So that's why all those techniques I'm talking about with the uh, free writing and the dream diaries, um, they're all about just letting those ideas out and not thinking too much about not applying that kind of thought process until, until later. And then being able to defend them. It's really hard to defend an idea when you don't really know where it came from, but that's part of the trick. So most of my talk is about uh, the explorer. I'm going to talk about the other parts a little bit too. Um, and then we're going to have QA, right? Where do you even go? How much Q, Q and A? Sorry, Q and A, right? Yeah, you guys think about questions you have now because it's really embarrassing when you ask for questions and no one comes forward and then I just stand here and you have to listen to me breathe in the microphone. Um, so I was talking a little bit about the, the, the artist. I'll just touch on these other ones uh, lightly, which is uh, the artist is all about, okay, now you've got a bunch of crazy ideas. You've written down the story about the about the giant spider, you know, you've, you've um, you collected all this stuff. And the artist actually kind of fits them together and sees which ones uh, kind of sing when you put them together. Like I brought the example of Grim Fandango. It, once we had, you know, I wanted to do a Day of, the Dead, Day of the Dead game for a long time. That idea kind of sat in my head for years. Like I really like these skeletons and I want to do something with these skeletons. 
And then I was just going to a lot of film noir movies at the time. They were having a film noir festival in my town. And all of a sudden, something clicked. It's like, wow, actually, these um, kind of plots that go on in the Land of the Dead could be these kind of crime stories from these Raymond Chandler novels I'm reading. And all of a sudden, just putting those two ideas next to each other, it was like all these sparks started flying off of it, and all these ideas just started ejecting themselves from this. Like, it's like, whoa, hold on. Like, we had the, the artists were just drawing every day these amazing things. And, um, and that's what happens when you sometimes put to make a connection between two things that, that hadn't really been connected before. Um, and uh, the Dalmatian. He's black and white. That was kind of the thing that made him like a judge. He saw everything in black and white because he's a Dalmatian. I was stretching things a lot when we were doing that. Anyway, um, the judge is about, to me, in games, a lot of it is uh, in play testing, but in... I come from a, like a writing background, and for me, the thing that really helped with writing was um, uh, writing. I was in a writing group. And when you're, you're um, sorry, do you have any water? Is there any water? Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> there was a um, a writing group I was in. We all bring in our writing, and we read them to each other, and then we just kind of like tore apart each other's writing and said what we liked about each other's writing and said what we didn't like, and you start to learn not to take things so personally when people are talking about your creative work. They're, you're, they're just looking at the results. They're not judging you as an artist or judging you as a person. They're just judging the words on the screen and like, did, did you achieve what you set out to achieve? And by doing that a lot, um, I learned to, um, to separate myself from the work a lot. And you learn great editing skills, like being able to, the old saying goes, sometimes you have to kill your darlings because when you're writing something, you just, there's this thing that you love that made you, the whole reason you wrote the story, but nothing else fits with it. And you got this whole great story, but this one part doesn't fit in. And you have to actually be able to kill it because it doesn't fit anymore. And you have to be willing to, to, to do that with these things that you were in love with. Um, uh, and Hal Barwood, one of the project leaders at LucasArts, the maker of the Indiana Jones games, uh, was a screenwriter in Hollywood, and he um, he told me to think about a spider web because I was having a lot of trouble. We had to cut the dialogue down, and I think it was Monkey Island. It was like too big for the disc, which is hilarious because it was all text. But um, oh my God, thank you so much, gracias. Um, <laughs> yeah, one single clap. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, uh, oh, yeah, to, to, I was having trouble. We were trying to cut down dialogue. I was like, I wrote the scene to be like eight lines long. Eight lines, that's no big deal. But when you watch people play test in the game, every time Monkey Island, there was a cut scene that was more than three lines of dialogue, people would start to like tap their fingers on the mouse. They're like, ah, oh, when can I play the game again? When do I have to? So we'd try and cut things down. It was really hard. Oh, hmm. now how silky smooth I am. Um, and, uh, he said, think about a spider web, like a, a spider web hanging there. Sometimes if you, you need to cut threads out of it. If you cut the right threads, the spider web doesn't fall apart. In fact, it gets more tight. It gets tighter because the other threads around it are now carrying more weight. And now the thing is stronger, and you can actually make it more sturdy. And that's the way that I learned to think about writing is that, yeah, sometimes you, less is more, and you can take out something that you were in love with, but it actually makes all the things around it stronger because they now have to carry the story. And so learning to edit, learning to critique your own work is so important. And we have this thing called the mandatory hour of fun at Double Fine. We started very early on when we realized that we were making second knots, and a lot of people hadn't played our game. The people who worked at the company hadn't played it. Some of the artists were just doing the art, and they're like, I don't really know how it fits into the game because I'm not playing it. So we said every Friday we have to stop, and the whole company has to stop working, and everyone plays the game for an hour. It's a mandatory hour of fun. And then we would meet afterwards and talk about the game. Like, what did you guys see? What did you guys think about And someone was like, oh... I totally understand why this jump animation has to have no um, hesitation beforehand or something like that. But you would start to work on talking about each other's work. And, and to this day at Double Fine, it's very hard sometimes you do a Hoff and people are talking about your game. It's really hard to hear everybody in the room kind of critiquing your work. But you kind of get a thick skin about it. You start to learn to like, you realize that every time someone gives you a negative comment about your game, it's this gift because it's a, it's a negative thing about your game that if you can find a solution to, you can turn it around. It's like this thing that just made your game better. So every comment you get is a gift that you should say thank you for. The meter it is, the more you say thanks because it's really helpful to you making your game awesome. Uh, and then finally, the bulldog, the warrior. It's, uh, it is a lot of practical things. You know, just... Um, 
of course, in the games industry, getting funding for your game, you know, running the daily things about uh, operating a game company or just, you know, you know how, what it's like to try and get through the world and make your thing and have it be a reality. But also it's, a, it's the little ways where you have to fight for your ideas. You have to fight for when you had that dream about the spider with the red and yellow legs. And some of the team's like, that's great, that's great. I think purple would be better. And then you're like, well, you have to choose. Like, do I fight for that idea? Or is it more important that they get their way with it? Because sometimes it's, it doesn't really matter to me. Like, oh, I just picked red. I don't know. It's not a big deal. But sometimes like, no, 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 no. This is going to pay off later when that big door is red and you'll know to be scared of the door. Some reason you have. But sometimes you can articulate it and sometimes you can't. And it's important to know when it is important to you. Because for me, I find that the things that are important stay important. And if I give in, if I give in on them and I make the spider purple... And I'll just sit there for like a month and be like, oh, that spider looks wrong to me. I don't know what it is. It's driving me crazy. And uh, I realized that I'm going to ask the person to change it later. I just haven't gotten the nerve up to ask them. And if I just stood up for the red and yellow spider in the first place, I wouldn't have to have wasted their time painting it purple in the first place. So I have to just learn to just be confident enough that, okay, I, made it, I really want that spider to be red and yellow. I'm sorry. Let's just do it my way. And then there's a counter side of that, which is if you're going to work creatively with people, you have to let them win the argument sometimes too, or else they're just not going to want to work with you. And so you have to know which spiders are important and which spiders you were just were filler for you, because it's probably important to somebody on the team. And um, you have to learn to pick your battles and really just fight for the things that, um, that really matter to you, because you can't win them all. Or if you do win them all, everyone will think you're a dick. Sorry. Oh, it's a big picture of me. You're at a lecture of watching me talk to you and a picture of me talking to other people. But um, this is just me collaborating with the team. It's not a very good picture of collaboration because I'm standing up talking to them. They're sitting down having to do what I say. But um, we really are a very collaborative group at Double Fine. And uh, we switched over. Our first two games we made was um, you know, Psychonauts and Brutal Legend, which were game ideas I had. And I kind of like fought for them with a team. It was like, you're going to love heavy metal by the time you're done with this. Trust me. And, um, and then we, um, we changed. We split the company into smaller groups and started making smaller games and letting other project leaders, other people with ideas, come forward. And that's been you know, incredibly rewarding for me just to, to see other people in the company grow into this, into this position and see all the different kinds of ideas that come up for games that I wouldn't have of thought of, like I never would have thought of an adventure game with Russian dolls in it that Lee Petty thought of for stacking, or uh, you know, an RPG game set on Halloween night. You know, like there's so many ideas that you could be trampling by trying to control everything. So we have this thing called Amnesia Fortnite, which is just our internal game jam that we've done for years. Uh, we opened it up to the public. We let the internet vote on which games we make, and it's crazier and crazier every year. And um, it's about what I realized I wanted to do with the company, which was not just make one game after another, but turn the company into um, kind of a creativity machine, like a, like a our working, repeating, this is my gesture for repeating. I don't know why I'm doing that. But like a, yeah, rep, uh, like a, like a wheel that keeps turning that um, new project leaders will come forward with ideas and we have a method for evaluating them. We have our internal judge procedure, you know, with this mandatory hour of fun that we still use. We have um, brainstorming sessions to, for the explorer part of the job, you know, and, um, and we have these methods for, for, in, like encouraging people to come forward with their ideas and then um, being really mean to them. We let people vote on which ideas we, we do, but then um, supporting them when they make those ideas and then actually getting those ideas funded and turning them into real projects and selling them and then repeating that whole process over again. Um, it's kind of inspired by... Um, do you have Newman's own salad dressing over here? I don't think you have that. Do you have that here? You ever heard of that? Do you know who Paul Newman is? Yeah. So, Paul Newman. No? Okay, Paul Newman. He makes salad dressing. You probably know him more as an actor. Okay, so Paul Newman was in some movies. Uh, but later in his life, he started this, um, he had this homemade recipe for salad dressing that he made, and he actually sold it in bottles. And he started this company called Newman's Own, and they make salad dressing. And now they make all kinds of food, pretzels and all kinds of stuff. And um, the 100% uh, of the profits that this company makes go to charity. And because he didn't need any more money, he just wanted to share his salad dressing with the world and 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 create this company which just generates um, uh, money for charity. And Paul Newman's passed away and he's dead, but Newman's own is still a company. It still exists and it's still this machine that's just cranking away money for charity even after he's long passed away. And I just thought that was really badass. That's pretty crazy. Like what a great thing to do. And um, 
so setting up, not that I'm planning to die anytime soon, but that, that Double Fine would be this, not just about my ideas, but the ideas of a, of a group where creativity is kind of supported and protected and engendered and a whole bunch of other words and, um, and can keep going on its own power. Well, I'm here in Barcelona. There's a machine running in San Francisco emitting games, which is nice. Um, but it took a lot of that knowledge about how to like work creatively with people over the years to get it right. Let's see if I... Yeah, because um, teams work with each other. They work through problems together to create art. And I feel like art is humanity's way of working through problems with its, each other. You know, we make stuff. We're exploring ideas. We're dealing with issues in art about why, why are we here? Well, you know, why do we treat each other the way we do? How does it feel? Why does my life suck? All these things that people put into art and we examine and we kind of, I think, by, enjo by enjoying other people's art, understand more about ourselves and we, um, we do, through art and through games, we, do, we practice a lot of things and we practice having emotions and I think practicing having other emotions for events that haven't happened yet in our lives and I think those are really enriching and they create more and more empathy in people which I think makes everything better in the world. The more empathy people have for each other, the, you know, the more humane we are with each other and that's why I think art is so important and why I think games are so important to art because they do that and I think in a much more powerful way than a lot of other art forms do. So um, that's why I think it's important to, to talk about games as art and to talk about ourselves as artists and not be embarrassed of it because I think it's a really important thing uh, to do. So uh, let me see how much time we have left. Six o'clock. Are we about halfway through? Where's Yvonne? <laughs> he tells me what to do. Um, I'm almost ready to start taking questions. Do you think we should do that now or should I just keep babbling on about stuff? Does anyone have any questions? Are they ready? Okay. I hope I'm any questions slide. You have to tell six and a half. Six and a half. Okay. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we're going to start with questions. I wanted to make sure we had enough time to answer um, uh, all the questions that you guys have. And um, if we still have time left over, I can just go back to talking about Dalmatians and all kinds of dogs and stuff. Who's... Uh, great, it's me here. So Hi there. My name is Mark. Uh, thanks for the presentation and your share of love about artists. Um, I was wondering, um, since you came up with a process to channel your creativity and then put it inside of your company as well um, to uh, create new uh, ideas and funnel it, uh, I was wondering if you have other process as well inside of your company other than artistically speaking, either for operation or for sales or whatnot, that you also empower like that. Yeah, I mean, we have um, we do have a lot of uh, processes at the company. After we've been around for 14 years, so we picked up some good habits and some bad habits. We after Psychonauts, we had a I mean, Psychonauts had a huge crunch mug, a terrible crunch mug, because we were like, let's uh, we got to make this game awesome or we're gonna die. So we stayed there all night, and then everyone was like, no crunch mode ever again. So we researched all these different production methods and started using um, Scrum, which is Scrum, if you use that term here, Scrum, and Agile Development, which is something very popular now, but it was, it was years ago, and, and that's more a process of instead of, um, to me the most important thing was like, instead of writing one big monolithic uh, design document to the start of your project, you take off a smaller, more dem demonstrable piece and make that right away and then look at it and then see what you want to do next and then create a backlog of tasks. And, and it's a much more organic way of working together. So we use Scrum and have daily Scrums. And each team, though, has its own method. Some people, you still use what's called a waterfall schedule, which is just, just like a Microsoft project where you have one task and another task and another task and another. And because um, they're more organized that way. And so each of our teams uses its own organizing principles. Um, but I've always, um, I've come to really like Scrum because it's kind of, I kind of like that idea that you don't know where things are going, which terrifies a lot of people, but I kind of feel like more comfortable with that. I feel like that, if you know exactly where you're going to end up, it doesn't feel like art to me. Like, I feel like you should have a little, some sense of chaos, some sense of like things could change. And so I like a more dynamic system. And then we have systems for, I'm trying to think of other systems you might be interested in, like how we reorder our copy paper. We have, no, we have, <laughs> we have a lot of, um, we have internal tools, like we have a tool that our, um, one of our producers, Gabe, wrote called Scrumptious, which actually is like, like an online database for running tasks. And all our tasks are shared online, and the, um, all the teams can look at the current sprint and how your chart is doing. So we're pretty organized now about that kind of stuff. And um, we have a few tools like that. 
but also with a small, we're still a pretty small team, so a lot of stuff we just get together and talk about. Yeah. Okay. Who else has a question back there? Who's got the microphone? Does someone have a microphone? Bang on it if you have one. Oh. Um, hi. Hello. Uh, thanks for backing again. <laughs> Thank you for making great, great games. Uh, I just want uh, I want wanted to know because I'm having uh, some bad times uh, this la later months, and I wanted to know if you have had any advice when you lost lost faith and motivation um, with video games and art. If you have any kind of advice to regain <coughs> motivation and patience uh, for for it. Yeah, like, do I ever, do I ever lose faith in, like, I mean, every time I read uh, YouTube comments, I lose. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah. And I really, no, it's, and that's a real thing. When I first started out, we didn't really have much of an internet at all, and so you'd make a game, and you'd see a magazine review about it, and that was all that you really had. And um, now, the second you make a game, you just get this hot blast of opinions from the internet, and and you'll get 20 nice comments, which really are nice, but then you'll just do this one negative one. This is, you're stupid, go home. And you just be lying in bed at night thinking about, oh, that one person really hates me. <laughs> no matter how many nice comments you read that day. Um, and some, some, this, sometimes just one person will make a comment on our forums at our office, and I'll be like, I quit. I give up the whole thing. I just don't want to make games anymore. <laughs> and it's not like, oh, poor me, so much as, you know, um, when you're making stuff, it's like Kurt Vonnegut, the writer, talked about how it's too it's impossible to think about the entire world when you're as your audience when you're writing a book. You just he just just to pick one person, like he picked his wife and just wrote all his books for her. But try to think about one person. Sometimes I do that when I'm giving a talk because it's too hard to imagine talking to a whole bunch of people. I'll think about I wonder just this one person what they think of it, um, and uh, that helps you get through it. And and that's great when you think about your, your, most, your most dedicated fan who loves your stuff. It's really fun to make stuff for that person. But uh, when you think about that one person who made that one nasty comment, you're like, I don't want to make games for that guy anymore. I'm just, ugh. So, um, and, but there's other times just because I'm so incredibly old, been around for a long time, you do get uh, tired sometimes. And, um, and different things have helped out. And if, for me, it sounds really obvious, but one of them is just playing games. Like I, you realize when you're, you're working really hard, you, it's really easy to put off playing games, like especially when you're in crunch mode, you have no time, if you have your, you know, your family, you need your time and your work, it's the last, you know, the first thing that goes like, oh, I don't have time to sit around and play video games, and you kind of forget why you like video games, and it feeds into a lot of this reason why you don't want to make them anymore sometimes. And I found myself, if I just, you know, get inspired by some new game that came out and I'll start playing it, I'll start to like have all these ideas about games again, you know, not just like imitating the game, but just like I have this other game for this other, other idea for another game I want to make just because I'm having so much fun playing this game. So really playing, just being good about, um, not, you know, not forgetting to play games, like every day, a lot of games. And, um, and, uh, and once I was, I was really, uh, I was really burnt out after Brutal Legend. It was a really hard game to make. And I was actually in Barcelona at a, at a previous games conference. I was in the hotel. I was going to give a speech like this. Um, I was getting ready for the hotel. And I got the call that, like, from our publisher saying that Brutal Legend 2 had been canceled. And I was like, oh, I guess after this conference, I'm going to go back home and shut down the company or, like, fire a bunch of people. And, like, that's kind of distracting. But um, um, that's when we got the idea instead to... <clears throat> split the company into the smaller groups to make stacking and costume quests and all those games. But part of it was being, I was in Barcelona and I was touring a lot of the Gaudi um, buildings that you have here in this beautiful city. And I was in the House of Bones and I was upstairs at the House of Bones just looking at all those amazing chimneys and just looking at it, just being inside of um, Gaudi's architecture. It's like being inside of the, you know, the mind of one madman, you know, you're just like, this is amazing. And I found that to be incredibly inspiring. And I just, that was the thing that like lifted me out of that funk was just being around um, all that art and just seeing uh, an artist, just what it's like when an artist is allowed to go nuts and go, not that he was nuts, but, you know, just to go, you know, like he got to make his stuff all over town, you know, and the town was into it. And that's amazing. You know, he didn't have to just, you know, beg to make tiny little houses you got to me so but i just was inspired by by his art so i feel like um experiencing great works of art by other people whether they're video games or architecture or anything is what i've always found to be most inspiring and then trying to really focus on the the people i'm making the games for and not focusing 
on the really negative elements, because the internet collects all of them. The internet collects every single thing, and it collects the worst of humanity. And like, if you just focus on that, it'll just make you want to quit every single day. And so um, it's really learning to figure out who you're making your games for and who you could pay, have to pay attention to and who you don't have to pay attention to. That, that also helps a lot. Yeah, I hope that helps. Yeah. All right, who else has a microphone? She's handing it to... Hello. Hello, team. Thanks for coming here. I didn't bake you, by the way. I'm sorry. But you didn't invite me. I didn't bake. I'm sorry. Oh. But I'm enjoying the game anyway. Oh, so. you can still buy it. It's on the iPad. Did I mention that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to, to ask, uh, uh, what were the negative points of your Kickstarter campaign? Because everything looks beautiful from outside, and you get a lot of money, a lot of cash, <coughs> but it's also probably a lot of job and a lot of things to take care of, and... And just, I want you to talk about your Kickstarter campaign for Broken Age. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a good question. What were the, the both positive and the negative parts of the Kickstarter campaign? Because, of course, everyone saw a lot of the positive parts because we made, you know, $3.4 million. And that was, that's a fun thing to do. If you guys ever get the chance to do that, you should do that. Because um, it's a lot of fun to have that much money for, you know, and just, just look at it. Um, <laughs> but the real, the really great thing about that campaign was it was this huge. Is say you're gonna think I'm being corny, but this huge outpouring of love from the community because we knew we had fans before, but these were like people coming to like, no, we want to be part of it. We want to help. We want to give you lots of money. And um, thanks for backing, by the way, Alex Regopoulos, another backer over there. So, um, and people just, it was just such a nice. Um, I always say it was like the end of uh, It's a Wonderful Life, that Jimmy Stewart movie. Where it's like, I don't want to spoil the ending for you, but let's just say something really nice happens at the end of that movie when you think things are the worst, you know? And um, his town, well, anyway, you should watch it. It's a good movie. So um, it, that was just really invigorating for me, talking about things that make you feel inspired and, and, and when you're feeling down, you know, and, uh, getting support from your fans in terms of a Kickstarter is a really great thing. Um, and then we in addition to that, took the route of being completely transparent with our, our process. So we do this documentary. People can see the good and the bad about our development. And that's been good and bad because people really, people really like it. They really, I think a lot of our community, a lot of our fans are also creative individuals and people who want to make games themselves. And I think they're the kind of people who feel like ideas are entertainment. Like they, um, They'll just respond. I think I do too. When I go see a movie, they're like, oh my god, this movie is just so full of crazy ideas I've never seen before. And, um, and so they like to see people engaged in the creative process, both coming up with ideas and then talking to each other and fighting with each other about these ideas and then figuring through problems um, and seeing people go through the same problems that they went through. But they also, that, the negative side of that is they saw, like once they saw kind of the scope of our game, <clears throat> I really felt weird about cutting it down. When I started realizing that like, oh, this amount of money is going to make a game this size, but I've been kind of showing this other game to people on the documentary, like, I can't cut this now. Oh, my God. So <laughs> that was not a kind of, that didn't fall out of the Kickstarter campaign as much as it fell out of that transparency. But that was the risk that we took on. We knew um, that's what we were doing. And I didn't have to, to do that. I could have just said, like, I know you've seen, you guys have all seen this game. I'm going to cut it in half. Watch me do it. Watch me do it on camera. I'm going to cut it in half. Um, I could have done that. But... Um, we decided to instead just sink a bunch of our own money into it. And, um, and then, but we, when we decided to do that, to like sink a bunch of our money into Broken Age and pay for the second half of it, um, we communicated it really badly because we communicated it first to our backers and they took it really well. And then that backer message got out to the rest of the internet and a bunch of non-backers heard about it and they started just, their, um, I mean, I don't want to say I was ignoring the legitimate concerns of people who were like, hey, the game's taking a lot longer than it should have taken. I mean, that's legitimate, right? Um, but uh, I knew in the end, they'd be, I felt like they'd be happy with the game that we were making. So that, that as long as we get it done, it'll be fine. But there are a lot of people who are actually also kind of sitting in wait. And there's a lot of people who just distrust Kickstarter. And they really don't like Kickstarter. And they think it's like you're getting something for nothing. It's a Ponzi scheme, which is just not the definition of a Ponzi scheme at all. But they, they think it's like a big scam. And they... Um, they're waiting for bad news about it. And, um, and when we announced that we were doing that, we were going to split the game in half and stuff. We got tons of, I have a slide for another presentation where I just have a lot of just really mean tweets towards us. And it's like, um, if Double Fine can't make the game for $3 million, they should just shut their doors. And I was like, that's, that's stupid. But um, 
There's so, so a lot of we got just uh, just a bunch of, of internet hate one day. That was um, we're like, huh? I guess we should have really thought about this difference between how much our backers know and how much the rest of the world knows, and how we um, send a message to. It's taken differently in these different groups. So we learned a lot about um, everything is new with Kickstarter. Like everything that we when we launched the game and we go over this in the documentary, we tried to have. Uh, kind of a, an embargo, if you guys have ever heard of like press embargoes on games. And a lot of people had not heard this term before, and you forget about it, because in the industry, you use that term so much when you're doing PR, because everything is embargoed. Everything you see in games press has been embargoed to a certain date. That's because this 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 reporter could come in Wednesday, but the other guy couldn't come in until Thursday, but you wanted them both had a fair shot, so you 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 made them embargo their story until Friday, and Friday is also the day you're launching the game. That's when you want all the press to come in. Everything is scheduled like that, mostly in, in games press. But a lot of people heard that term for the first time. They're like, embargo, how dare, how dare they? How dare they do this? This is really bad. And um, I got this game because I'm a backer, and I'm also in the press, and so I'm going to write a review of it, and I don't care what he says. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break this embargo. And so it, normally when you embargo something, you're just asking people who are in the, in the game's press to honor this date that you picked. And um, it's a few people, and they're used to it, and it's not a big deal. But when we're talking to our 90,000 backers, who had never heard about this term before, and they're like, who are you to tell me what I can talk about? I'm making a Let's Play video about the whole thing. So um, it was impossible to control until it just spun out. So within a few days, we had to like, hey, forget it. We never said embargo. Never mind. Ha, ha, ha. So definitely that was one of our bumps in the road. Um, and we try and go over this all in the documentary, but it's it's overall been massively more positive than negative. It's changed our company forever. I think it's changed the whole industry forever. Like the way um, games are funded has a whole new option now, and so it's sad. All right, next question: Who has the microphone? Oh, there you are, sir. Hey, uh, my question is about how how do you identify when idea is a great? You have to fight for it. When you d d you defend the yellow spider, in, in instead the purple. Uh, it's a one. red and yellow striped spider. Sorry, <laughs> I I mean it means a lot to me, man. Sorry. <laughs> so how do you how do you identify the the important ones? Which ideas <clears throat> do you want to fight for, and which one you are going to just give give up give up give up? So how do you make that judgment call about what to fight for and what not to fight for? Sorry? So that's what you're saying, is how do you make that judgment call about what to fight for and what yes. not to fight for? <coughs> well, I'm saying that that's kind of a, an intuitive thing. It's really hard to describe in, intuitively how to do that, but I think you have a sense uh, deep down about how, things ma how much things matter to you. I guess you're talking about how do you objectively know if it's a good idea, but I feel like, to me, it's more... I guess I operate more in terms of these compulsions. You know, I would call them these weird compulsions. Maybe they're archetypes. I don't know, but there's things that, like... Oh, I really want to make that spider yellow, and and you more like you feel it. You feel like um, I I really need it to go this way, and um, and there are these things in in Psychonauts like that. There was this whole there's a sequence where Raz goes up to a gypsy caravan and, and he goes inside and it's all staticky and he turns around and the static behind him and then he punches his way out. And that was this thing that I just saw happening exactly the way it happened in my mind. And for months I described it to people and people were like, this is going to be too complicated. This is really, I don't even know how we do this. This is really hard. How are we going to do this? And it was one of the things I just couldn't let go of. So it wasn't really like I made the choice of, of that was an important, that's a good idea. I'm going to fight for that. It was more like I had this, like my teeth were sunk into it and I just couldn't let it go. I was like, no, this is the thing. You can do anything you want with those trees in that other level, do whatever you want. But this, this thing has to happen this way because there's some weird demon in my head that's going to pull me into Hades if I don't do, I don't know what it is. It's some, um, so I feel like it's about listening to your instincts and trusting yourself about that stuff. Because a lot of the times when you, like I was saying, if you give in on these things, it's because you, it's a social pressure. You feel like, oh, I don't want to make a stink in this meeting about the spiders. And, and I, don't, I don't want people to think I'm a prima donna because I'm asking for things to be exactly my way. And it's true that if you ask for everything to be exactly the way you want it, you, you can be, that's really difficult to work with and no one's going to want to work with you. But if you pick the things mostly based on your sense about about to be in touch with something that you're not aware of. And that, that's, that's what I've learned to trust, is that feeling of like, I just know this is an important idea, you exist on things. Um, <laughs> if I sound like a child, they won't want to hurt me, right? I, um, 
So I just feel like there must be some reason. I feel like deep down I just trust that there is some reason why I want this thing to happen. And then later sometimes it's, it's, it's validated because someone will be like, oh, it's great they did that because it totally made me think of this, this other thing. And I was like, yes, that's why I did it, but maybe not. I don't know. Um, and I'm sure there are other more objective ways to find out if your ideas are good or not by bouncing them off other people. That's something I could try sometime. But um, mostly just go with my instinct on that one. All right, over here. Is there a question over here? Or who has it? Oh, over there. Oh, you. You behind the bright light. No, that's fine. No? I, yes. Yeah. Oh, Whoa. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Um, excuse me. I'm an engineer. So, um, yes. So, uh, my question is about why you do what you do. Like, what's in it for you? And this is like from a perspective of someone who is starting here and you have been there for a while. I like I played some of your games when I was a kid. And the reason why you do what you do, the, why you create games, has always been the same or you got started for some reason and now it has changed over time? Hmm. <coughs> um, why did I start making games? I mean, um, like a lot of people here, I played games when I was a, a little kid. I just always loved them. And for me, it was like a, a special thing of all. I had, you know, I was a family of five, and I was the only one who really played video games. And it was like this little private place that I would go into. And um, I think the desire to make games, a lot of it comes from uh, a desire to create uh, little worlds, little little places to go to. Like I always loved little miniature things and little fantasy things, like just train sets when I was a kid. I used to love train sets and just putting my head down on the board, you know, and watching the train come right in my eyeball, you know, and just like looking at all the little towns, all the little people in them and then crashing the train through them and just all this stuff. And there are these little things that like um, in a train shop, I remember seeing this thing they made. It was just a little box, but it was like an infinity box where it had two mirrors on the inside, but it had train tracks and it looked like a, a coal mine inside. And then if you hold your eye up to the window and you look inside, it just goes on forever. I just love these little like dioramas and stuff like that. And I think uh, when Ron Gilbert talks about why he came up with Monkey Island, he often will talk about being on the Pirates of the Car Caribbean ride at Disneyland and wanting to jump off the ride and just hang out with all the skeletons down there. Um, which sounds really creepy when you put it that way, but it's, uh, I totally understand that, that urge. Like when I was in, you know, when I'm on different rides at Disneyland, I always wanted to jump off and like live in those crazy worlds. Um, and even when they seem kind of fake, or especially when they're like a touch, a little bit fake, you know, like there's a, cause that's, that's what makes them kind of magical. And um, just always want to make those, those experiences happen. I know that's the feeling when, I saw my first Day of the Dead art book, and I was like, oh, my God, look at these little skeletons and their little brightly painted things, and I just wanted to just jump in there, and I want to jump into that world. And that is where I feel like, for me, the creative impulse in all these games comes from. It's just I want to make something like that. And the more I can hook someone into it and make them feel like they want to go back to that world, the more successful I've been. Like, you know, when you're playing a game, and you're just like, um, and maybe you're thinking about it because you're thinking about progressing the next level or something. But often for me, it's like, I, oh, I really want to go back to that place. I just want to hear that music again, and I want to be in that space. And that's, that's the big core of it for me. So I think that's what, what keeps me going as far as the creative urge. But there, there are other things at different times. Like, you know, starting the company, it's now kind of, you know, like a family, and you're working with other people who you just enjoy working with. And that process can be the thing that you're interested in. And sometimes it's just hearing from someone who says they grew up playing your games. You're like, oh, wow, I actually made something that someone else connected with, and that's the gets back to what art is all about. And so that's something that um, I think keeps you going, for sure. All right. Who's got the mic? I don't know if I can call on these people without microphones, but there's some people down here, too. Okay. Hello. Hello. Um, well, thanks for coming first. Um, thanks for your games. Thank I'm you. I'm sure they have been uh, like a inspiration for many of, uh, of us to, to get into the video game industry. <laughs> uh, okay, so you were uh, designing games for many years, uh, especially the graphic adventures uh, from LucasArts. Um, so my question basically is how you deal now with a new design of a graphic adventure for a different audience that uh, they don't have maybe the patience that they used to have before. <laughs> and, uh, and they have the playtest. So I'm sure you, you go through the playtest and the, com the players complain about, oh, this is too difficult. And maybe you think, oh, this is way too easy. So how you deal with this? You follow your guts? <laughs> yeah, my guts. My guts, thankfully, sizable and, and always pointing forward. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, that's a tricky problem, especially with adventure games. And um, 
And a lot of it, you know, the history of it, with each adventure, adventure game we made back in the day, we never really felt they were, we always liked them, and we always, we didn't think of them as successful in the same way as, the, they never sold as well as Sierra games. We were always like, oh, why can't we sell like King's Quest, you know? And um, when the management looked at the numbers of it, they are like, you guys, I felt like they were going to fire us every day, like we, every time we made a game. So all those games, um, we always were trying to, we were always trying to get more people to play them. And so... Um, each game, you can see there's a progression in the interface. The interface is always trying to become more elegant and less intrusive, and that's when um, uh, things like a full throttle went to a, there's a full screen with no verbs on the screen, and um, uh, that was trying to make it more cinematic looking and more elegant, more like natural to someone who doesn't play games all day. And then um, uh, Grim Fandango being 3D, that was a really commercial move. People don't think of Grim Fandango as being this big sellout game, but it was like that was the, like at that 1996 when we started that thing. It was like 3D. It's really hot. Um, and you got to get into it. I really didn't want to do it, but um, we finally found a way to do it that we liked. And so we we're always trying to reach these these more massive audiences. And it was a really big relief when the Kickstarter happened because I was like, oh, well, I'm not really trying to reach this new massive audience. I'm trying to make a game for the people who backed it, and the people who backed it. I think they like adventure games because that's why they backed it. So I, now I can make a game that ha can have dialogue trees and doesn't have to really apologize for being more slowly paced, more, you know, thoughtful and, and you know, because with adventure games you always have this, uh, I don't want to say chip on your shoulder, but like when you go to a show like E3, a big trade show in LA where like there's big screens everywhere and it's super loud and like everything's blowing up and boom and and you're like, I want to do my story about this dead skeleton who's selling travel. Like, like it, it's hard to get a, like a sell a, like a quiet story like that um, in that environment. And you're always like um, feeling like, oh, this. It's it's hard to be. It's hard to just be selling this um, kind of game in the in the in the world. But then the Kickstarter came along, and I was like, oh, I don't have to sell it. These people already bought it. This is amazing. So. Um, then we just had to navigate that space between when a puzzle is too hard. And, and when we split the game in half, we naturally, the first half is a lot easier than the second half. And so there were a lot of people who backed it who were like, this is too easy. Um, and that's a tricky thing to solve. And I don't know if we solved it completely right. Hopefully when the second half comes out, they'll feel like it was the right difficulty level. But we do with a lot of playtesting, you know, like a lot of um, watching people play. And that's hard. Watching someone stuck in an adventure game puzzle is one of the worst things in the world because they're not having fun when they're stuck. And then when they solve it, um, like if you the the thing that Noah Falstein shall always say is that if you ask an adventure game player like why are you why are you like banging your head against a wall and the person's like oh because it feels so good when I stop you know like <laughs> so when you're playtesting you're watching someone and there's a, you know there are a bunch of people in the room it's so awkward and tense because the person's clicking and they're like, oh, making these sounds with their mouth like oh so I'm not having fun and you're just like you're making these notes cut this entire section of the game. <laughs> And then like, oh, I don't get it. And they, and they look at you like, what? look at this crap on the screen. They're really mad. And, um, and when they, then when they figure it out, they're like, oh, I'm so smart, I'm so smart. And they're dancing around. Uh, but if they get a hint from you, they're like, oh, I never would have gotten that. You know, so the, basically they're grumpy. Adventure game players are grumpy, that's all I'm saying. But it, 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 is a, it is a fine line. But I think you have, to, um, you have to think about whether those moments of being confused are entertaining or not. That's the thing. Is there's good confusion and there's bad confusion. And you know, when I used to do these um, <clears throat> uh, around the kitchen table at night, my brother always had these, often had these weird riddles. Um, you know that riddle about the guy who's, who's laying face down in the middle of the field with a backpack on, how did he get there? And you can ask yes or no questions of like, did the, did the guy die of starvation or whatever? And you, and you ask until you find out the solution to how he ended up in this field. Anyway, my brother used to do these things a lot and they're always so fun because he was right there and I would ask a question and the way he would answer, he'd be like, yes. No, no, and he like there's something about the way he was kind of winking, like you almost got it, you should get it. The confusion I had wasn't frustrating; it was really entertaining because I felt like I was right on the edge of solving this amazing mystery, and I could do it if I just went a little farther. And I think a really well crafted adventure game has that feeling of like ah, I should not not a complete like well, I don't know where to go, I don't know what to do. It's never like that if it's done done right. It's more like wait a second, this door jiggles in a weird way, and this key is with the thing, and I feel like I should be able to put these things together, but I just haven't figured out how. How can I do this? And then, boo, the light bulb goes off, and then it's a really pleasant sensation. So pleasant sensations, that's the thing. That's the key. Okay. Do we keep going, Yvonne? It's 6.30. Yes, Check. please, if I can. What? I can ask. He, he's going to prevent me okay. from asking my question. Okay, you just tell me when to stop answering questions. Okay, when you're tired. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> tomorrow? Right? Okay. Two, two more. Oh, I come guess. on. No, we can go longer. Come on. Okay. As long as you're not. As long as they're not doing a movie in this room later. No, three. See, now I look like a good guy. Three more questions. Thanks for setting me up to look like a, to look like a generous guy. See, now? We'll so, do three. <laughs> so can I then ask my question? Yeah. Who, where? He, who's me. talking? Oh, yeah. way back there. Hey. Uh, so I'm Daniel, and uh, I really want to say how I like your character about the Guardian, because this question of mine is really coming from that uh, uh, thing. You like the who about the Guardian? The what? Yeah, the character of the Guardian that oh, defends yeah. the, mm -hmm. his ideas, because this, this question comes from that. And my question is the following. How many beers do I have to buy you for you to come to the first floor and check out our games? <laughs> I've already been given three beers just during the interview process here. I can give you four. Okay. Um, I am going to come to the, the room with all the games in it and play all those no, games. We are not in that room. That's the problem. Oh, we're there's another the, room. Yeah, we are in the room above that. We are even better, you know. Uh, oh, wow. You're so competitive. <laughs> okay, no, I'm going to check out all the games I'm here because I am very far from home and I might as well see everything there is to see before I go back. Okay, we'll, right. I, it, I'll thank you for okay. that, actually. I'll see you up there. All right, now we have to do three more. <laughs> that was just a blank. <laughs> okay. Who? There you are. Is that huh. Ronnie? Yes, it is. This is totally a plant. Yeah, totally. <laughs> hey, um, you keep, you, you've been talking about different things during the talk, about intuition on one side, and then commerce on the other side, about business. There is one thing that I sort of wanted to ask you about um, that sort of I, I feel ties into both of those. You feel it what? How, I feel it ties into both of those. What is the role of just experience in all of this, of having been in the industry and learning? Like, what things do you consider really valuable experience that you've gained over the years? Uh, yeah, what things, you just, you just want to point out how old I am. I know. That's really what this is all about. Kinda. Yeah, exactly. Well, experience is, of course, essential, and if you're not my exact age, then you don't know half as much as I, no, I, um, let's see, how does experience help? I mean, um, a lot of things, as far as business goes, you take a lot of things, well, okay, here's, uh, I've learned a lot of different things in business, um, uh, I've learned to be. I've learned to be less. Uh, I think the word is pugilistic. Like I, I, I fight less. I, when I started in the industry, I was very like, I was in Lucas Arts and I said, management. I'm gonna fight you to make this game, and I'm gonna. You're a bunch of jerks. And, uh, um, and I really didn't have to be that way. I could have just. <laughs> I've learned a lot more about how you know, even though they're management and even though they're at a publisher, they're actually relatively speaking human beings, and you can. They probably actually have the same goals that you do, and you can actually just you know, work like a mature adult, and, and I was very young when I started in the industry, but like, you know, um, there, there, I, I just learned to be less confrontational and actually work with people more and with publishers more and um, having better relationships. So that just comes with maturity for me, just learning to like mellow out a little bit and stop going home in a seething rage because someone was, you know, wrong at the office or something like that. Um, but I've also learned to take things in stride as far as the um, business you know, once your company has just almost gone out of business, like the eighth time or so, you kind of like get a little more mellow about it. You kind of like, oh, I guess, you know, we're not going to go out of business this time because we didn't go out of business the other time. And we'll probably be okay and things will probably be, you know, straightened out. Because, um, you know, starting a games um, company, if you have employees, if you have a bunch of employees just sitting, you know, it's really stressful to think about how you're going to pay them all the time. And, um, and, you know, Psychonauts got canceled and we almost went out of business. And then, uh, we had, you know, almost went out of business getting Brutal Legend signed, and Brutal Legend got canceled, and we like had all these periods where like we're down to our last um, paycheck and stuff. And I've learned to just take that a little bit. I mean, first of all, I learned to get better at being farther away from that point where you're almost going out of business, um, but also to um, just, uh, you know, having been through a lot of things before, that I'm not totally panicked about a lot of these situations um, anymore. Um, so that's the, mostly on the business side, fighting less and, and being more calm. And, uh, and creatively, I just learned, I feel like I try to um, be more and more uh, confident in my ideas because I think it's, um, 
it's, it's hard when you're starting out and you have these weird ideas to think that they're okay. And I, I tell a story a lot about how that's the thing I learned from Ron Gilbert on Monkey Island, that I was, I was writing dialogue for the, the villagers in, in Monkey Island, and I had to distract one of them. And, and I was like, I put in this, I couldn't think of anything else. So I put in, look, look behind you, there's a three-headed monkey behind you. And I was like, that is so stupid, because everyone knows monkeys don't have three heads. So. But I'll come back, and I'll, t- I'll cut that out later, you know. And, um, and then Ron Gilbert would come upstairs and check out our work in the afternoons, and he would laugh or not laugh, and we'd make edits. And then... Um, and he saw that line, and he laughed, and I was like, no, no, that's temporary. I'm going to take that out. Don't worry. He goes, no, no, that we're keeping that. That's good. That's funny. I was like, that's stupid. He goes, no, in fact, we're going to have Steve Purcell draw a 300 monkey and put it in there. And I was like, you're crazy. And, um, and then I learned that it was fine, that I was like, oh, this is a really ridiculous idea that we had. It's entertaining, and I should really stop censoring myself so much. And there's a lot of things like that. There's a lot of things as I get older that I realize these things that I kind of censor before anyone else hears about them, I let a lot more of them go, and I let more of them go forward and have more confidence in them. So I just, I guess, I get more trusting of my own instincts as I get older. By the time I'm 70, I'll finally be a normal person about it. Thanks for asking a question, Rami. Duke of the Throne is awesome. Right? Yeah. Woo! <laughs> Uh, hi, I have the mic. Hi, Tim. Hello there. How are you? Um, I had more of a like a like a personal question towards you, and it's regarding technology when it comes to to games and how it becomes obsolete. Like, for example, if I were to uh, if I wanted to play Green Fandango, I wouldn't be able to, you know, like buy it install it on my computer right now. Well, I will in a few months when it's released on PS4. But how do you feel? As your games, you know, as time goes by, that your games are not are no longer, you know, available for for the people that you made them for. I mean, that's, it's really frustrating. That thing about um, you know people not being able to play Grim Fandango is one of the one of the motivations we've had for constantly trying to get those things to come back and um, being able to do that with um, Sony and Disney recently, where we're going to bring Grim back and make it available is really exciting because I was like, oh, people can can play this again. Um, but there always has been this. Um, this, I mean, it is kind of those games are out out there, and the things that have kept them running, like you could, there are ways to keep you know Day of the Tentacle running if you have a copy of it using um, Scum VM, the, the virtual machine for Scum, and Residual VM dot org is a site for running Grim Fandango, and um, these are just kind of fan created sites, and it's actually the fans who have been doing the archiving for the games industry all this time, at least especially in the old days, because we were terrible about archiving our games, and we would just, um, you know, some people would burn copies of the games on the floppies and bring them home, and now you can't read the floppies anymore, or whatever. The archives are just like a shambles all over. Um, kind of like the same stories you hear now about film preservation. They go into the vaults of Paramount, and all the, the some classic film is just rotting on the reel because no one's ever preserved it. And a lot of games are that way, except for, except for, for the fans who've taken them and preserved them themselves and reverse engineered them and made them run better and fixed bugs in them and kept them going. So um, I did not expect that when we started making them, that it was going to be, um, that people were going to be smart enough to just take these things apart without any sort of source material, but they have been doing that. So I kind of have this feeling like, uh, at least it's not all completely lost. But we also, it's not too late. You know, we, we are going back now and trying to find all the source material we can for Grimm, you know, trying to go back, trying to find as many original sources as we can for everything as we research, you know, kicking off this project. So um, it, it, it's, I think there is hope for all those games not, set, not being obsolete because of... Uh, this kind of group project that the internet, the fans of games can work together and come up with things like uh, Scum VM and stuff to keep them running. So yay, fans. Is that, is that it? Is that it? Okay, everyone, thank you for coming. Thanks for asking questions. Nice to meet you.